Please give a very warm welcome to Eric and Dixie Levin. It's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here and see such glowing faces and to know that you're here in the interest of entrepreneurship much, much different than it was when I got here in 1947 on my birthday. I grew up in Buffalo, Nevada. I don't know how many of you know where that is. Right across the room. Be mindful of the mic. Mesquite. And it's a desert country. Dry, hot. And of course, uh, agriculture was the thing that we were involved with. And it's, it was difficult and hard. I didn't realize it. That we were, I didn't realize we were poor. We were just the same condition as everybody else in town. And, uh, and I had a happy life. A busy life. We had to work. I can tell you some stories that I tell my grandkids now, or my sons. <laughs> but as they were growing up, the world is so different now than what it was then. But when I got here in 1947, it was my birthday. I don't know how this happens to be here. <laughs> this is what I probably be. They have three home shirts. They're corduroy pants. And some socks. Not kind of great, but that was it. My father drove me up here. Let me off. The dorm tour was over here at the end over here where the, the old administration building is now, I guess, maybe it's the Dominion building. That's, that was the dorm, and my father dropped me off, and he had to go back to work. And that's where my life here at then BAC started. Okay. Thanks, Dad. I, I'm proud of my dad. It's... Um, I'm going to work real hard not to get emotional. Not hard enough. Those of you who know me, it, just, it comes easily to me. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to take some snippets of what dad, his dad's story. I've heard that story many, many times. But I want to relay it to you. Those, you know, the reason you're here, I think you have an interest in entrepreneurship. Uh, my father is a representation, an embodiment of an entrepreneur. He, 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 he started as an entrepreneur in a different time in a time when opportunity wasn't as available as it is now. But our world is filled with opportunity for entrepreneurs to capitalize upon. But there are, there are principles and characteristics of successful entrepreneurs that are the same today as they were in, their, in the 1950s when uh, Dixie started this business. And I'm going to highlight those as well right, uh, right now. Entrepreneurs rarely uh, begin the develop, development process with a desire to, you know, they, they know exactly what they want to be, what, exactly what, they, what kind of business they want to start. Uh, it, it rarely happens that way. If it's happened for you, that's great. But you need to understand that if you don't know, you just want to be an entrepreneur, that's okay. That's okay because rarely success stories come, you know, you don't wake up at 16 and say, this is what I want to do. You investigate things. You look, look at my dad's career. He started out, you, you, you heard all the numbers of jobs he had. He did that for subsistence, but he, he learned uh, how to work hard. He learned that he could depend upon himself to create energy for himself. And, uh, and so that's a, I think that is, a, that is a characteristic with successful entrepreneurs. Successful entrepreneurs need someone who partners with them, who's there to encourage them. You heard him make that expression about my mother. Uh, that's true. My mother has been, uh, has been his strength. And it's, and, and it's the reason. She and he are the reasons that we have had such success. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about where our business is today. 
Successful entrepreneurs also have opportunities that fall in their laps a little bit. <laughs> and the opportunity that fell in dad's lap uh, that caused an opportunity to make a choice was this experience with Woody Romney. Uh, that's an important co part of our company's history. So Mr. Romney came and said, Dixie, you're good at this. If you make this much money today, if you an audacious money, will you stay? And you heard him say, uh, of course, yeah, that's all I'll say. Everybody's good. They did it. They did it. And, and, and that's what the community needs an opportunity like that. But they also need to engage in what I call measured audacity. Uh, measured audacity. You understand what audacity is? Audacity is I'm going to think big and I'm going to jump when I see the opportunity. But measured audacity requires us to be thoughtful and, and, and to measure uh, you know, the, the options. My mom and dad, my dad had the audacity to go home to his wife after, as they were packing to move to Sacramento and say, I have this opportunity. Uh, together, they engaged in measured audacity by going through the process to make a, a decision to go this way and to forego the certainty of that career for, to enter into something that was uncertain at the time. Uh, I, I, I've heard them express this many times that that was, a, that was an important moment in their life. Successful op uh, entrepreneurs learn how to become self-starters. I love the story and the, vis vi the, the visual of my dad driving around the block listening to one more song because he was scared to knock on the door. Uh, he had to get past that if he was going to be uh, if he was going to be successful. Each of us have within us those innate fears of failure, fear of failure, or fear of not measuring up, that we have to power through, and he did that. Uh, and, and it allowed him to be successful. Uh, successful entrepreneurs are resilient and adaptable. Uh, the story of the mines closing is a really important data point in the history of our company in that it, it, it caused Dixie to say, okay, I, I, I will never again be in this position where I am so reliant on one revenue source that I have to, I have to find another way around this. And so we engaged in adaptation and risk management by saying, I'm going to find a, a, a broader uh, revenue source, and that's where property and casualty came in. Uh, successful uh, entrepreneurs choose good partners. And I spoke, spoke about my mother as his partner, but uh, he, he, he gained a partner in his brother, Bert. Uh, the, 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 this 60-40 shared ownership model that, that they gained together became the foundation of our company and exists today. We have uh, over 150 of these relationships across 23 states that is modeled essentially after Dixie's arrangement with Bert. And we think it's quite telling and poignant that our business is built upon the same principles of two brothers who got together and negotiated uh, an arrangement that aligned their interests because dad wanted to make sure it was meaningful enough to him and he had a, an, enough opportunity for success that he'd move his family from the Bay Area to Las Vegas. But he also understood he needed to be to, to have engage in risk management if it didn't work out. Uh, we are forever grateful uh, as a family and as a company that that model was, uh, was, was formed. Successful entrepreneurs also find ways in which they uh, can offer opportunity for others who engage with them to build their business. Uh, you, um, those of you who become entrepreneurs, you'll, you'll largely do it on your own or maybe with a cohort. But you'll come to find that as your business builds, um, you need other people with you. I see my dear friend, Carrie Smith, who back here. And if you know Carrie, he did that. He, he, he found people that he, uh, he saw he couldn't do it all by himself, but he brought people in and gave them incentive, either through equity or through bonuses, uh, to build his business. I, we've done exactly the same thing, this shared ownership model again. You find good people who have the energy, want an opportunity, but may not have the capital to be able to, to do this. Uh, successful entrepreneurs find those people, engage them with them. Successful uh, entrepreneurs also, at, when the time comes where they understand that uh, 
th that they have gathered around them individuals who can drive their business forward. They, and they know when it's time to, seek to uh, engage in a succession plan and find new leadership. Uh, my parents, uh, uh, as, you said, as he said, uh, were called as mission presidents. And when they returned in 1987, uh, the odd thing, he was 57, 58 years old. He's exactly the age I am now. And I remember when he came back and I thought, well, of course, he's not going to come back in the business. He's over the hill. He's ancient. It's, a, it's over for him. I didn't really think that. that was, <laughs> but I did think that. I didn't think it exactly that way. It seemed natural. But here I am at 58, at that same age, and now I understand how visionary that was for him, really at the prime of his life, to say, this needs to be uh, my sons and their cohorts uh, are, are doing a good job. I'm going to step aside. Now, he, he did some other things. He didn't, he, the rest of the, you know, the last, uh, what has it been? Gosh, 30, Dad just turned 90. The last 32 years have not been fallow for him. There have been a lot of things that he has done and built. Well, that's another story. But uh, I, I am going to be facing the same thing at 58 years old over the next little while. Who, who's going to, you know, there's going to be a time soon when, when it's very clear that people that work with me and are my partners in this can carry this business forward in a way that I can't. And so successful entrepreneurs figure that out. Many, many businesses fail because the founders uh, are too proud to say, I'm not the smartest person in the room, or, I'm, uh, or I can do this by myself. I wanna, in just the last 10 minutes that I have, I want to uh, talk about what the Levitt Group looks like today. And let me just preface this by saying this is not meant to be boastful. Um, it's not. It, it, it is meant to, uh, to show you what can happen over time as true principles are formulated and adopted in a business and they are, and they are adhered to, uh, to, the ex to the extent an organization can, what can happen financially and what can happen in terms of the way businesses can be built. In, uh, in 1984, when Dixie left, the, the revenue uh, in the business was, uh, was 5.5 million. Uh, from 1985 uh, through, we'll call it 2010, when the world kind of had a bit of a pause economically, our business grew at a compounded annual growth rate of 18.4%. Now, if you chart that out, that's pretty remarkable. We went from 5.5 million in 1985 to just, a, just about 200 million in uh, revenue in 2010. Uh, Today, we have approximately $275 million in revenue. Uh, Tyler gave the, the, uh, the employee count. That, uh, that I'll have to uh, carefully um, correct you. That 400 is only in Cedar City. Uh, we have uh, about 2,050 employees across the country in 23 states. Uh, in 1985, we had 64 employees. Now, we have a little greater than 2,000 uh, families whose livelihoods are assisted by this company. And that's a, it's a real blessing to be able to be in that position. Again, I say this not to be boastful, but uh, to, to, to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the foundation that was built by my parents and upon which we have added with the help of many, many wonderful people, but the principles that we have, that we have, uh, that we've adopted and adhered to are the same principles that my father established. Now we've done probably a better job at articulating them and writing them down than he did because he, he was just, uh, he was a, a, an entrepreneur that didn't have a lot of help. Now we've got a vast array of really good writers who can be thoughtful and write things down and do mission statements and governing principles, which you don't do necessarily at the first of your business. But I'm going to just go over uh, Lever Group. We have seven governing principles, and I can't do them justice uh, in the time I have, but I'm going to just list them and ask you to, to write them down. If you miss it, I can email you these. The first one is that uh, at the Lever Group, it's, and there's a reason why this is number one, and it's that we, we seek to be honest and operate with integrity. Um, integrity is something that you accrue over time. 
and you build a, upon a foundation. We've built upon a foundation of our parents. We've sought to build on, uh, to, 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 to enhance that and build upon it. Integrity can, integrity can also be lost in a moment. And so it's important for us to have that be our number one principle because it's on our minds all the time. Number two is that we seek to serve stakeholders. Now we hear a lot about shareholders, but the term stakeholders uh, connotes a much broader array of, of individuals. Stakeholders can be em employees, it can be shareholders, it can be the public, it can be uh, regulators, it can be vendors. Uh, we seek to serve these stakeholders uh, in ways in which they would like to be served and, and that benefits them. Number three is that we seek to align interests. Business deals uh, that are one-sided are temporary. Uh, they will fail. It doesn't, I don't care what anyone says, a one-sided business deal will fail because eventually the side that is uh, not being enriched appropriately will get tired of it and seek to get out of it. And it will do great damage and, and, and will incur economic, emotional relationship loss that is, uh, that is inefficient. Aligning our interests, finding business deals that are win-win is the most, not just the most uh, effective and efficient way, but it is the way that all business deals should be sought to be created. Number four is that we seek to grow profitably. Uh, we, we live in a time when corporations have a bad name and the idea of profit uh, is, is viewed negatively. Uh, we, we believe that profit is an important part of not just re, uh, rewarding the shareholders, but creating security and opportunity for growth for businesses. Opportunity for growth is what adds jobs, it's what adds opportunity, it's, it's what adds career pathways for individuals that come into, into the company. So number four for us is to grow profitably. Number five is to adapt. Uh, we live in, in amazing times, but they are changing times. And if we're not constantly finding ways in which we need to adapt and, and ex executing on that adaptation, uh, we will fail. Uh, Dixie's early adaptation, uh, an even earlier adaptation <laughs> for Dixie was within uh, a month of him start opening up his office in our basement, the basement flooded, and all of the assets of the, 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 it was the global headquarters was the basement. <laughs> all of the assets was a, was, a, was, a, was a, uh, a file cabinet, and they had to take all the files and put them on the, the, uh, on the cement so that they would dry. That was an early adaptation that my parents had to engage in. And you think about that, that you know, all the things that could have happened that would have led to the Levitt Group not, ex uh, not existing today. That was one of them. Number six is to enjoy. It's really important to enjoy what you do. Uh, just as business deals that are, where interests aren't aligned isn't sustainable, enjoying what you do in your work is not sustainable. Life is meant to be enjoyed. We are meant to be enriched by what we do. That's not to say every day is enjoyable. I love my job. Not every day is enjoyable. There are days when I wish things were differently. But I've come to understand that over the long run, those days that are less enjoyable not only help me appreciate the days that are enjoyable, but it helps create in me capacity to be able to, um, to drive the business better. I'm grateful. Some of the best things in my life have been the things that I have enjoyed the least. You will come to understand that as you age. And the lastly, last, our last uh, governing principle is that we communicate with reason and civility. Um, these all are linked together, but uh, we live in a time, and Dad referred to this, we live in a time when reason and civility are not the primary tools we use when we communicate with one another, whether it's person to person, over social media. Uh, this is a, it is a, we are at a crisis point, my good friends, in this area. Uh, learn, learn to communicate with reason and civility. Learn to make allowances for the value of another people, the other person's opinion, even if it's different than yours. Uh, we have gone away from this. Uh, that is a critical part of our company's culture 
and uh, we are swimming upstream. Um, and, I, and, and you, as the future leaders in business, I hope you adopt that as one of your personal governing principles, or I hope, hope you're privileged enough to work in an organization that puts a high priority on that. My time's up, though, but I, I just want to express to you, uh, on Dixie's behalf and, and on my mother's behalf, uh, our gratitude to each of you. Uh, you are our future. Uh, we wish you the best to the extent that we can be helpful to you in charting your course, whether it is as an entrepreneur, whether it's uh, just your interest in our business, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to answer any questions you, you have. Dixie and I will stay here. If, uh, rather than take the time for Q&A, because I know the class period is ending, we'll make ourselves available if you want to, to spend a minute with us. But please know of our gratitude for the opportunity, and good luck this semester. Thanks.